Welcome back to CodingCat.dev, where we give you cats the freshest dose of dev snacks. Here is Alex Patterson and Brittany Postma. This episode brought to you by Storyblock. Build anything and publish everywhere. I want to do it every time because it's just, I hear it every time and I want to say publish everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. I thought that was really you talking too. I was like, dang, he's got this down. <laughs> I think we do actually do the everywhere thing every time. It's it's probably bad, but hey, we have a new editor now, so yes, we can get it edited out. It's fantastic. We don't even have to mess with it. For the for the first time in uh, what, three years ish, we've been doing this now. Um, a actual episode to YouTube and to Spotify because Anchor is now Spotify. It all just magically appeared, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> That, oh, man, that's worth all the money we're it's paying, so nice. which is nothing yet, but, you know, it will be. It's fantastic. Anyways, today we have Adam Argyle on. Hello, Adam. Super excited. Wow. <laughs> Hello. Thanks yeah. for having me back. It's been a minute. I think last time you had your neon icon, and I'm still in love with it up behind you so for I those... think you had just gotten it and you put it up like in the episode that we did <laughs> sounds about right yeah it's uh it hasn't been there for that long um but yeah i'm glad you like it it matches y'all's colors so good I know. that's I that's know. probably what i love the most maybe i could get a cat neon mm -hmm. probably said yeah, that last time i still haven't done anything with it what, you, what else you got behind you there for for folks on the audio what's oh, is that okay. like a mini ukulele what is this? It's a soprano or whatever. Yeah, this is Duke the Ook. I think it's tuned. Yeah. Uh, oh, I thought he was going to keep going. We I didn't know off. if that was a perception <laughs> thing. And that Today was actually a full size seeds? guitar. That was really far back. <laughs> I did at first. I'm like, it can't be. Those tiles aren't that big. <laughs> That's that really, been cool. really cool, though. Yeah, if all of a sudden it looked like a little mini thing and I pull it up here and it's humongous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, maybe our new editor could do some like visual tricks too. I, I don't know. I don't know what capabilities there are. Asking a lot. <laughs> Today we're going to talk all about CSS. Essentially, the the best title I could come up with. Adam Argyle presents CSS features for 2023 and beyond. And beyond. <laughs> we fly into the future. That's so much better than I ever would have. Yes. Well done. It's like a <laughs> Superman to the future. Um, so there's been a lot of changes, and I, I think um, past episodes we kind of talk about how like the browsers feel like they're finally coming together, and we're like agreeing on things and shipping things for the the first time in forever. And so I feel like, and maybe Adam, you're closer to this than us. Do you feel like that has steadily like picked up, and things are shipping finally? Yes. Oh, we are shipping all sorts of stuff. The interop efforts have been stellar that sort of uh, these browsers agree at the beginning of the year. Here's our our endeavors. Here's our goals together. We'll try to do this. Um, and that's worked out really, really well. I mean, at the end of the year, not everything's shipped and that's okay. We've got stretch goals. You're allowed to stretch and not yeah. reach it. You know, it's not like anything happens to you. There's no ruler that smacks your hand like Chrome. You said you were going to do that. And it's like, oh, my, my Git repo hurts or something like that. <laughs> Uh, but there are things that, um, you know, they're, they're not, everything's not shipping all together all at once. Oh, that's almost like that movie. Um, you know, like Firefox, we're still waiting for has. We're like, I know it's behind a flag. I can try it. I can see it working. Um, and I don't know what the holdup is, but I would love to see that ship a uh, color level four uh, in, in Firefox. They've got the, the parsing and the, the ability to show these wide gamut colors, but they don't have the gradient stuff yet. Um, Anyway, so there's still some say, rough edges, but yeah. Yeah, I was going to say something along those lines, too, that it seems like we've seen this shift with Jen Simmons being hired at Safari, and Safari's been catching up on a lot of things and not the one lagging behind as much now as, like, we're seeing a little bit of lag from Firefox on some of the newer features, which is unfortunate, but it is nice that we have that thing where you can work together and have goals mutually, not as just an exclusive company, but everyone together all these goals i think they're actually out shipping on a lot of things uh the chrome team and stuff it's it's kind of bananas now it's they're it's ahead of us in a few different ways yeah they're ahead and or they were ahead in color they're they're definitely ahead in some typography stuff um they have a good strategy too which is wait you know for yeah. everyone else to like figure it out get it right. done write all the tests 
and then they show up and they're like oh cool this looks ripe and ready for us to just bang out and sure i like they this <laughs> that's how i I've run my it. career <laughs> just wait yeah. for everyone else to get it done uh what so what do you what do we think like this is Mel, let me back up let me back way up so we we last had you on um I put the date in here somewhere in December of 2021, I believe, and you can correct me on this. Open props was kind of an infant at this, at this point. Right. Uh, tell me, tell me about open props and kind of what's been going on with that. Have you How added a ton to it? It is uh, doing very well. Um, I'm Cause I don't advertise. Is it a teacher? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd say a preteen. It's definitely no longer a baby. It's been adopted by various families. Uh oh, how weird is this going to get? Um, <laughs> 1.5.8. That's like a in dog 1. years. 1.5. It's like 30 years old. I think I'll old. do a, a 2.0 sometime soon when I ship um, the new color stuff, uh, which, because right now it's just like Tailwind where you got to pick a, a palette, you know, and you got to pick, oh, do you want orange or do you want cyan and you kind of like get these chunks or you can get all the colors which is like a it's not a humongous download but you know it's a little wasteful whatever <laughs> there's a bottom nav bar that down there you can click on colors if you want it's very sticky yeah. at the bottom uh, um colors but all in all what's happened is so it has lots of organic growth one of its best features is that it doesn't tell you a methodology most things they don't push a methodology like utility methodology is a great methodology. There's nothing wrong with it. And open props works with that. Open props works with any methodology, which means um, if you're not just styling things with React in the front end uh, and you're building a back end and something that's a little more vanilla, or let's say you have a status 404 page where you're not going to bring React. Anyway, these variables are a tiny download and they make every single instance of every front end that you make look like they're coming from the same family. And so really there's cool. design systems that are adopting it. A lot of times people adopt it just because it has documentation and they get to, you know, not document all the props. There's also a, a fun concept of like, these are your uh, global props, but then as a, as a team, you can make house props. So you give them a name, you know, um, something that's more meaningful to your team, like brand color is a good example of a house prop. Um, and then there's adaptive props. So there's like, we're just getting into this. Well, I think we're still even just ramping up as an industry into these orchestrations of front end custom property stacks where there's just various layers uh, and open props is there for you. It's nice that you can take just the shadows. Um, the easings are cool. We're about to do an update on the animations so that they're automatically going to have reduced motion versions for you so that you just nice. use an animation. And then if someone wants to reduce motion, we've done all the research and all the work to give you something elegant uh, that works for that. That is so wonderful to not have to worry about. I, I mean, like accessibility should be a priority, but like not having to worry about that, bringing in something is so nice. And the CSS transitions are just beautiful. Thanks. I love these, uh, the squishes there and the elastics. I use those mm -hmm. all the time. Like that's another thing, open props, you don't have to bring in all of them. All the time I'll make a demo where all I bring in is the easing because I want a little squishy bouncy one. Like beep, 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 beep. Um, I love how these colors are working on all these as I scroll. This is bananas to me. Like, oh, So you have like a background yeah. gradient that it's like going across? Yeah, so you set a background gradient and then you fix it. And so that it each, each instance that uses it is like a little window into yeah. a gradient that's actually fit to your viewport. So yeah, the that's gradient wild. stays still and it's like a mask effect, um, but it's ancient tech. I mean, background attachment fixed is, it's, it's ancient tech. And it's rad. <laughs> that's really cool. So it, it sounds like this is moving along. I love it. Um, and I, I think in open props, you're probably utilizing a lot of stuff that we want to talk about. Um, that is coming out too. So I think you brought up one that I want to dive into a little bit that's gotten some some press lately, if you will, in the, the front end world, the the has. Let's talk about that for a minute. Are we all excited? Like you all? Because I'm I'm not good with this stuff. I'm I'm excited for has. I use not a lot. So I'm also excited to have has because I use not which they seem like opposite of each other, because if it has something, you want to be able to include it if it's got that class, as well as not if it How doesn't many, have that. Do we have a good example of this working? 
Adam, I know you said on uh, nerdy.dev you had some some of this working. I'll bring yeah, up the dev uh, tools if you want. Sure. Um, yeah, and it's even I progressively enhance it. So if you visit my site nerdy.dev from Firefox, you get a different um, you get different behavior than you do in Chrome because of has. So that side nav uses has. So if you select one of those, you can even use the keyboard because that's a radio list. Um, uh, do you want right, me to like? One, three, I don't know. Yeah, go in there. But when you click one of those, mm -hmm. that's setting a radio button selected state. But you notice that an entirely different UI element on the page has responded to that. The list of cards. The list of cards is filtered based on the state of the radio button using has. Um, nice. And has is so special in that you can, any element's state can pivot any other element's state. It's not just a parent a selector. It's a, a universal family selector. It is insanely powerful, which means any, so that's just using the checked state of a radio. You can use checked of a checkbox. Any pseudo class that's on any element can trigger a state change in some other element somewhere else on the page. Wow. It is extremely powerful. You can also use has to select previous siblings, not just subsequent siblings. You can wow. also use it to select the one before you and the one after you, but not the other ones. You can combine it with quantity queries. You can combine it with, it is so cool, so powerful. Um, and we'll eliminate a ton of JavaScript once Firefox has it and we can just freely use it. Um, it's really, really cool. Did I hear like early on, there was some like comparisons on, on as far as like, the I'm gonna call it CPU, whatever. The computation was a little hard on some instances, and they've like fine tuned and fine tuned, and it seems like it's pretty. Everyone's starting to use it now. So, considering like what you used to do in JavaScript to has, I feel like it's more optimized, right? And there's like there's yes. got to be like a render cycle piece to this too, so that you're you don't have to actually get in the event loop on the JavaScript side. The CSS is just able to render faster. Yep, the, the 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 cost of has is the cost of the selector speed, which generally we don't ever have to deal with in the front end. There are ways to stress it out. <laughs> uh, and then there's also ways to make it better. Just like if you want to focus on selector performance, which is a whole topic, uh, and it's sure you can measure it. Uh, I just have never built a site that ever the selector performance was bad enough where I had to go research something. That was like 10 years ago, people were doing that. Um, we now have advancements in the selector engine that do its own optimizations. Um, so you shouldn't have to worry about it too much, but you, if you want to be considerate, the thing not to do is kind of what I did on my site, which is utilizing a, like a nested state and then referencing it from the tree root, which is what I do on HTML and then selecting something else. It's, uh, it's slow in terms of comparing it to lots of other selector speeds, but it's not so slow anybody's going to notice it. So maybe if I stacked up 100 of them, you'd see something, but um, optimizations are going to come later for this. And I would say don't worry about it, but yeah, yeah it's fun. It's fun, nerdy research if you want to dig in, though. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I love it. All right, let's let's uh, let's start bringing up some of, oh. oh. Yeah, what Brittany have to say? Oh, how do you, do you um, polyfill that? Like, how do you progressively enhance it and do that in Firefox? Yeah, query selector all. So that's what I do in a lot of my demos where um, if I can check for support of it from JavaScript, if there's no support, then I just write the query selector all and uh, crawl the parents and do the work. It's usually three or four lines of JavaScript. It's really not that big a deal, depending on the complexity of like what you're doing. Um, and yeah, it is not hard to polyfill at all. I mean, let's, let me re rephrase. It's polyfills typically mean your JavaScript is watching for CSS usage. I don't quite polyfill it as much as I write JavaScript that flags the parents so that it's easy for them to do the same behavior that has was doing without the flag. Um, and so it's not quite a polyfill and that it's always going to automatically update, but it will, it's like only a few lines of JavaScript to recreate the case and the interaction pattern that you want and back it up with some JS. Yeah. We would rather not be using JavaScript for CSS stuff, but sometimes we have to, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Some CSS things don't polyfill very well. And polyfilling CSS is really hard anyway. There's like eight ways to put CSS in a page. And so it has to observe all eight of those in case they change. Because oh if they gosh. change, you expect the polyfill to update its JavaScript implementation so that the page looks. Anyway, it's that's a whole hairy topic. Polyfilling C CSS is really hard. Is there a good tool out there? Auto Prefixer does that, right? Auto Prefixer does it at build time. Yeah, they'll look at your uh, target browsers that you want to support. And then at build time, it says, I think there might be a client side one too, uh, where it could go look at every, pro that one's easier. Uh, Cause that one's just like a property lookup and then they prefix it or not. Um, mm -hmm. But you think okay. about things like view transitions or scroll link to animations or has some of these like, like really powerful ones are really hard. Container queries was pretty hard to uh, polyfill. The polyfill we had went through multiple versions because each one was deficient in some way um, mm. until we settled on one that's like pretty good. And then the browser- I could see how that would be really hard because of, it has its own like algorithm, right? Maybe, yeah, maybe that's- Yeah, you parse the media query <laughs> yourself. Yeah, you parse it. There's nothing that's helping you parse that. You've got to like, you know, it's kind of like regex if you want. So there's like multiple strategies, right? You can regex, look for container queries, then select everything between the curlies. You can parse and try to tokenize everything. So like post CSS has a front end, like JavaScript implementation. You can feed it a string of like a style sheet and it will parse the style sheet and give you back tokens and you can walk them and, you know, do your thing. Um, but that's pretty heavy handed if all you're doing is swapping a couple props here and there, you know? But, yeah. Uh, we're going to pause for a minute and, and uh, thank our sponsors. Does that even make sense? I don't know. This is why we have an editor. Wait, here's our sponsors. <sighs> How in the world could I forget about this? There's no need to freak out. We have Storyblock. Robert, you're right. But we still need a plan. Okay. How much time do we have left until the launch? 24 hours. Okay, let's go. We are ready to publish. So let's get this baby online. Thank you, Storyblock, for being awesome sponsors, as always. And a cool video. We love that video. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They, uh, they do a pretty good job of it, though. I mean, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, what I want to dive into, um, Adam actually wrote an article about a month ago, month and a half ago, uh, called Six CSS Snippets Every Front-End Developer Should Know in 2023. Oh, I'm scared now. 100%. What if I don't 100%, know that? Then that's okay. That's kind of the <laughs> point. Is I was like, this, these are all stable. These are all fine for you to use. If you don't know what they are, then here's your chance to, to ramp up. How about this first one? Container query. This is fun, yeah. right? Right. Everyone's like, we need container queries. We need them so bad. Let's get them. And then now they landed and I've met so many people. They're like, I don't use them. I don't and you're like, you ran wrong for years. You better start using them. I'm not threatening anybody like that, but I'm like, hey, <laughs> you should know what they are. If anything, you Was should at least know Scott what they are. <laughs> no. <laughs> he was talking a lot about them on uh, syntax. I don't know if he is or is not using them now, though. So, so I would as ahead, someone who is like is clueless on CSS most of the time, um, container queries versus just setting up like a flex or a grid or whatever, what, what is this actually doing? Are we setting the styles only on this container? What, what is this? Yeah, great question. So like, yeah, you can have a very containery responsive layout grid and flex box. They know how much space they have. If you put wrapping in there, they elegantly wrap or don't wrap. You can kind of constrain it saying, hey, here's the minimum size of my content and maximum size of my content. Figure it out, right? You have these like <laughs> space adaptive layouts. They're really cool like that. Container queries um, are more about like how uh, you have a container, obviously, <laughs> and it's the, the thing that you're watching its size of and it can't change itself. All it can do is report its size, and then you can select other elements based on the size of that. So where we do that with the viewport now, you can now do it at a per element level. Um, and like 
we'll look at gradient.style soon, a website that I made, but like that has three main columns of content and those are each a container and each of the components inside of there can ask the container, like what size are you? Because if it's really big, um, it might actually shrink its own card size to make room for other cards. Um, right. And so you have these components that can ask their parent, how much space do you have? And if it's a lot of space, I'm going to be a horizontal card. If it's a skinny column, I'm going to be a portrait card. If it's even skinnier than that, I'm going to get rid of the image. I'm just going to be text. So, so you have so this, this is even beyond like Something. it used to be how wide is a whole window and we'd base like everything off of it. Now we're asking like this container only like how big are we? That. Yeah, something that really clicked for me was how media queries will affect the layout of your entire page. This will affect the layout of just a single container, and it can be any container. So it's oh. like you can just shift your layout around within a single element. Yep, you got macro layout. So that's where you're adjusting the page. Uh, you're adjusting your components to the entirety of this the viewport, which might not always be the screen. And then you have micro layouts, and these can help you adjust your micro layouts. Like you could even think about like a an icon can do this. So an icon can have four different sizes and qualities where if it's in a space that's really small, like a tiny button, maybe it's just an icon button. It's its most simplest shape, but that can query its parent and be like, if I'm used in a different context, I can grow and add more detail. And then as it gets more space, grow and add more detail, duo tone, you know, and you can sort of um, adapt something very dynamically to the space that it's within. This is something I really want to start using in the design system I'm working on at work and how I know it is supported, mostly supported everywhere now, right? It's full support, but how do you make sure that it has support? I think we go back to IE 11, which if, <laughs> what do you use or how would you like polyfill those and make sure that you can continue to use that? Yeah, so there's um, just like normal, you got two strategies. There is a polyfill, so you can load JavaScript that will watch your styles and will adjust the, the selectors just like you would if the polyfill didn't get loaded. So you can use that for IE 11. You can also use progressive enhancement. So the default state of your component looks great. And then if container queries are available and it's in a large amount of space, they go horizontal. And on IE, they didn't get the horizontally adapted card. You're like, <laughs> whoop do do you know, like they'll live. Um, so you would just do a check for if container queries are available. Yeah, or you can just write them, right? CSS is awesome the way it goes. Hi, I just read a bunch of stuff I don't understand. I'm moving on. <laughs> I love sure. that, yeah. Good stuff. It's kind of like HTML where it just doesn't care. It just doesn't care. There's other cool things. And yeah, let's talk really quick about that syntax there. You have the container and at container. So at container lets you specify which container you want to observe because you can have multiples. Mm -hmm. And then the container keyword is how you specify what should be observed and you can name it optionally. And I, I would highly recommend you name these things. So that way it's not an anonymous lookup. It's a mm -hmm. named lookup. You're like, look at the card layout container, you know, um, and use it that way. Oh, we should have talked about how has can also do cool stuff. Like if it's this the only featured element in a container, um, it could adapt itself to the tree. So has also has this ability to not just adapt to the state of other things, but the tree structure that it's within. Um, it's really. I cool. don't know can if you I fully scroll correct. down that. in the H in the CSS there Amazing. inside the code pen. Uh, uh, inside the code pen, yes. and see, is there another container query that has a lookup for the name? At oh, layer. did I not do a named lookup? Oh, at layer is a cool, that's another fun feature. Yeah. Um, I saw the at container, but that's not a named lookup. And I was wondering if there was a named lookup there to see what that's. Yeah, you could like. add it because I think I named it, right? Yeah, my container is you named, named a couple main of panel. Them. There's a main and a, another element up there at the top. Is that oh, these? a layer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So there's the container and the container name. So it's going to find the nearest container if you don't specify it, but you could give it a name there. So after at container, you do space and then specify the name of the container that we gave it above and should continue to work as, as okay. it before. Awesome. Yeah. Wild. There you well, go. Uh, yeah. To, to recap for you, Alex, on the tree structure, um, like imagine a card um, doesn't have a product image. That hmm. tree structure is different than a card with a product image. Imagine one that has a, a for sale banner in the corner of it and one that doesn't. Has can 
change based on the tree children that it has. Oh, wow. That's pretty wild. I never would have thought about it that way. This card has a sail. Then give it a different background color. Yeah, green. Does not have an image. Then make sure the title of it is bumped up so that my mind is blown right now. Yeah, I would have never thought about that that way. That's really cool. Oh my god, Um, that's so powerful. I completely forgot what I was going to say, but we have a component that does that where, like, one of them has a different structure. Oh, on mobile, our accordions have a different markup structure than the desktop version. I don't know how you would do that with a responsive viewport but i just have to make two components and say if it's the screen size do this one if it's not but i was like oh maybe i can use has but i don't know how i would do that with yeah you might be able to use has and container queries because it could become tabs if it's got enough space and if it's in a constrained mobile layout make it accordion a vertical stack yeah um, so don't use the viewport because if you used a media query and you put that component um you know, it does, it's not as adaptive because if you put it in a sidebar, you could have an accordion in the sidebar. And this is smart enough to know that it's in a constrained container, even wow. though the, the screen might be huge, right? But you put it in a sidebar. The same component could be in the main page as tabs because that container has enough horizontal space. That is really yeah. powerful and wild. Wow. Yeah, my mind cool. is just blown right now. <laughs> Yeah, mine too. I mean, I've I've like heard a bunch of stuff and has. I'm like, I don't know when else. We have a filter it. sidebar that uses accordions, and now I'm like, oh, I need to redo all of my accordions I just finished. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of the a lot of the media queries that we were writing could be replaced with a container query. I think most of the time our intent was on the container. Yeah. Um, but we just didn't have that. And so we'd, we'd be like, well, 768, cause it's a tablet. Right. I'll just assume yeah. it's a tablet-y thing. Yeah. Um, and now we can get more specific and our components. Here's another fun thing about both of these with has and with container queries, the ownership of itself is contained in the component itself. You don't need to query the global page, the glo- like outside of it doesn't matter. This thing is just like, I contain all my own logic. If I'm in a big space or a little space, I know how to adjust. If I have an image or not, I know how to adjust. Our components are far more intelligent than they've ever been before. That is wow. amazing. And you, and never mind. I'm not going to ask that because it's just going to keep going. Uh, <laughs> let's go to the next one. So the next one is scroll snap. And this thing, when I think I can get it to do it, maybe oh we've had this for a while right we've had it for a while but people still don't know it exists if you're on windows by the way dude and you're using a mouse wheel hold shift and you can horizontally scroll a scroller i'm on mac but look at that you can do it on mac too um so so, yeah the idea here is a well Oh yeah, it's a well orchestration orchestrated scroll uh, moment where you have like this is kind of like a carousel where they're snapped in the center. When they're snapped to the start, it's almost like you're on Netflix. Yeah. Snapping to the end is just a stylistic choice that you could make. Um, so this, yeah, this the, sorry. I always use this I, for I, quick I links saying, on the same page. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say it might be hard for people to understand what I'm doing when I'm scrolling. I'm not stopping with this blue box. Yeah. At the start. It's doing it. So it's like, snapping to the position that you define. Yeah. So that's that's what we're talking about. And these I, stop at the center. On yeah. on my site, I have like quick links that jump down and it will scroll down and it will like stop at that section for you, which is yeah. Really cool. I call them like a um like if you're going on a tour across the country, you'll make all these landmarks. You're like, oh, these are the special places to stop. That's essentially what you're establishing here. You're saying these are strong resting points. They're mm-hmm harmonious with our alignment with our layout like that's why the scroll start example there is always on netflix where uh, you yep. scroll an item and it snaps perfectly to be in line with their grid layout and so uh, you can snap things there it also has a perfect touch experience so if you're on mobile these things feel extremely good because while they're not normalized by javascript a lot of carousels will write custom javascript to watch your pointer and then like do s- something when you fling but if you use scroll snap, you get the built-in behavior that everybody that uses that operating system has known to come and love. And so that's why they'll they'll use it very naturally instead of be like, there's something weird happening. Like, watch when I do this wiggle. They're like, it's not doing the wiggle like when I normally wiggle in a, in a native app or whatever. Yeah, I've seen a lot of like that. JavaScript yeah. things trying to do that. And it's always so far behind. It's like, oh, this isn't right. And it's not like a jarring experience either. It's a natural transition to that element. I love that. Yep. 
Uh, snap type. What's that all about? Is that just so you have? Yeah, you have a mandatory or proximity. So you can say um, always rest at one of my articulated, you know, stopping points, or just hey, if if it's close to it, snap there. Otherwise, let the user scroll free. Ah, uh, okay. So it's like yeah. that's really cool. I love snap, that one. Stop. I, I didn't snap, know stop. Tells you. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no. I, the only thing I can think of right now is, uh, do you guys watch um, The Office at all? It's like, oh, snip, snap, yeah, snip, did. snap, stop, start. Stop. I don't know. I don't, nice. I don't know I remember that scene. Right now. Yep. Jan telling it, uh, him to snip, snap or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, snip, snap, snip, snap. I can't handle. Yeah, that was a painful moment. You're like, ow, no way he did that. Wow. He is I learned that was all ad lib too, which was super exciting. Wow. I had no idea. Michael Scott, you smart your pants. <laughs> I have uh, not heard this one. I played with this one for a while, and I still don't understand, like, when would I use this when I'm, like, <sighs> there's a deck of cards, like, splayed out, and I want to, I don't, t tell me about grid. I mean, that, that is a use case. Here, I'll send you a GUI challenge on, oh, what did I call it? Um, I use Place I Content Center all the time, so maybe I'm already doing this. I just not heard it called Grid Pile. It's not so the it's fact that they're in the center. It's the fact that they're all, it's a grid. So normally with the grid, you make a grid with like multiple cells, right? You'd have like two columns or three columns or something like that. Here's a card stack. Yeah, check it out. Oh. Uh, here, I'll go to here. I'll send you this link. This is the just because you mentioned card stack. So you can actually see literally a card stack that Ooh, also has a really cool animation because it animates the uh, um, perspective origin, the transform origin. So like uh, you change the radios on the left and watch the whole thing adjust. It's really fun. Oh, um, and that's oh using the same God. concept of a grid pile. So the grid pile. So the the concept of the pile is, you uh, we tend to reach for position absolute when we want to put something in front of something else. So we have the concept of a stack, and sometimes we think of like a stack of cards, but that gets mixed up with this concept of a stacked layout where it's like, you know, like row, row, index. row, row. Like what? Like Z-index, like elevation, bringing things closer? Yeah. So the pile is about this concept of something is in front of something else and they're on top of each other, which is not a very normal layout for the web. Yeah. Right? Things always flow. So mm -hmm. what the grid pile does is it says, I'm a grid and I only have one row, one column, and that means I have one square and I'm going to stick every oh. single child into the same square and you get them piled on top of each other without position absolute with also the ability to put things in the top corner, bottom corner, center, et cetera. So you have them all share a space, um, but then you get alignment opportunity and you get all these other like things that you can bring to it. So basically the pile layout is a great way to avoid position absolute, which is always wiggly and hard to manage <laughs> and opt into a grid version, which is much more manageable um, and just as if not more powerful. This is bananas how it's doing like the rotational. I'm trying to wrap my brain around how like maybe a modal and you have a close button in the corner and you want to position that in the corner. You make a grid container on the whole modal and you put it in the corner. How do you position that? Absolutely. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could do that. So you could have your, you got like a dialogue element and it's a grid layout that says everything's in one cell. And then the, the first child of that would be like your, the regular dialogue content, but yeah. the second child would be that button. And you'd say, okay, so these are stacked on top of each other. When you did the pile layout, the X button would be in the top left corner. Um, and then you could just say, all right, we'll be in the top right corner. And now they're technically Z index. And since it's the second child, it's on top. And then you just positioned it into the corner. So no position mm -hmm. absolute, but you still get the same look um, without the baggage. I like it. Awesome. I had not That's a good one. That. Yeah. So, so I'm that have to play with it to really wrap way. my brain around how it works. But. Yeah. So this is more of a conceptual idea, right? Than it is like grid is what you're using. A grid pile is not necessarily like a CSS thing. It's just a, it's an idea. It's a technique. Yeah. It's a way a to avoid position absolute um, and still get all these fun alignment properties, which is also means they're um, logical. So if someone changed the writing mode from right to left or whatever, um, your your normal position absolute would would struggle there unless you're using inset, but yeah. Anyway, I've always kind of wondered. Uh, I I don't play with the left to right, right to left stuff that often. If you say like position or like it in an absolute context, and you say top zero, top five, right five, does it flip? 
when it goes the other way or no? It, it does not. Yeah, yeah so that would yeah, that you got to use cool. inset block start or inset yeah. inline end or whatever. Yeah, you uh, yeah I fail at that all the time, don't I? <laughs> yeah, that's all I started good. using inline and block a lot for margin and stuff. I love those. Yeah. Nice. Do you do a newsletter or anything that sends out like when you write these articles? I have. So, yeah, there's a couple places. So um, this one was on web.dev. You can subscribe to me. Um, I have RSS through web.dev there. Go to the author's page. You'll find me. My own personal website, nerdy.dev, has RSS. You can subscribe to it there. Um, cool. I'd say subscribe there because that's I'll share an article that I wrote on web.dev there. Um, but I also do a lot of blogging for myself. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm going to do that. I think I get your newsletter um what is the next one so a quick circle which i just closed the wrong nice. thing oh we lost your screen yeah, yeah sorry <laughs> there you go so this one's just like a mashup of really modern css and i'm like everyone should know how to make a quick circle this used to be an interview question that i had um for years when front enders would come in they'd be like i know css i'm like cool let's make some shapes it'd be like the place we'd start it'd be like make a circle make a triangle um just tell me your process for these shapes and so now the circle is so streamlined. It's awesome. How do you make a triangle? Can we do that real quick? That one, it depends. I like I'd still use, I reach for that. clip path these days, um, but you could still try the, you know, the old border trick if you want. Just that I bet Jay so killed way. that interview <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the shapes. Yeah, Jay, I don't do that one anymore, at least not a Google one, but yeah. Was yeah. Jay part of your team? That wasn't an association, right? Jay, Tom, was. yeah, Jay was Tom of our team, but he is left our team. Yes. 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 Interesting. Cool. He's doing some crazy green sock stuff. I'm trying to keep up with. Oh yeah, yeah. Green sock is all powerful. It is awesome. There's so many things in there that I'm trying to figure out. Could we move to like Svelte Spring instead, though? I'm like, like different animations and transitions and stuff. I'm like, hmm. We'll see. Um, like the. The one that comes built in was felt. Yeah, exactly. All those use CSS transitions under the hood. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, the there's one called, it, you know what? I'll just, did you see the other day I, I posted on Twitter with the light bulb thing that Jay was doing? Yes. Which, that one, yeah. And it does the wiggle on the bottom. So that, mm -hmm. that wiggle part is part of their SVG more for some sort of phrase like that. I'm like, I think you can still do this without that package. And that's one of their paid packages. Wow. So it'd be yeah. kind of neat to like make those, since we're transitioning felt, make those more felt like in their yeah. transitions and states and stuff. So I'm sure so talking to you yeah. CSS experts, we could probably just do it all in CSS, but I have no idea. All right. Control variance with at layer. So we talked a minute about layer. What What is this doing? So uh, creating a layer in CSS will trap all the specificity of the crap inside of it, like literally trap it. Um, so you could write a... Can you say that again? Uh, trap? Crap? Specificity. Oh, specificity. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and so it's like, it's nice. You'll like, uh, you could write a, you could write a, a, an ID selector in one of your layers. And if that layer was like a, um, so your layers also are, in order so just like in sas you'd make a big old project and your index.style file or whatever your index.sas file would be littered with all of these imports in meticulous order right <laughs> the meticulous mm -hmm. order cannot be messed up you yep. will have side effects right enter at layer at layer allows you to define layers that say these are priorities of the cascade not only are they priorities they trap the specificity of what's inside of them into that layer and they allow you to add stuff to it later so a lot of times what you'll do is start a new file and say here's my five layers of my project i got base utilities reset components and overrides for example you have five layers and you put them in order very specifically overrides coming last so that anything in there is very strong yeah. now what's cool is overrides could use a selector it's just a tag name. It says paragraphs. All paragraphs are font size 18 pixels. It will battle all the rest of them. Zero. You could have a paragraph ID selector, whatever you want, and any of those previous ones, and it don't matter. The specificity <laughs> of that is trapped. Oh, we lost her. Um, her internet was really struggling today. <laughs> oh, dang. 
Um, She'll do that. So yeah, it, it traps the specificity in there. And then, um, hello. Did only I get kicked out? Yeah. Yeah. What? I, I think you're wireless. Stringer was just like, you're done. Stop talking now. Aw. So how does, when, when we talk like Svelte stuff, Svelte styles are actually at the component level. I think it puts like crazy unique. Like, it gets hash. a hash. Yeah. Robo, yeah. robo yeah. name. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. At the end, is this, does that compare in any way? Or this is because it's in the CSS like specification, like inherently different somehow? You can use this with Svelte's CSS modules. So CSS modules is a methodology. It um, works kind of exclusively with class names, and they do their best to scope things um, with the robo class name so that you're not competing with other things. Now, layers can help you there. Um, layers can, um, so yeah, the methodology of like scoped classes is different than your, your stack of styles and how sure. you want them all to cascade yeah. at the end of the day. So what I'll do like in my personal website, which is on built on Preact and some other stuff, um, there's a components layer. And the components layer is just the one just before overrides. And um, all of my components pile into there. And their styles will always win over the normalize and the reset and any base and scaffolding styles that I have. And I don't have to ever think about the specificity because the specificity of those previous ones are trapped. And I can be very minimal with my usage of selectors now because of layers. Um, and I have confidence that I can add new stuff into the components um, at any time. So that's like, like another superpower of layers. They have an asynchronous aspect to them. Once the layers are established, you could you could write a whole bunch more stuff, import a whole other style sheet at the very end of your style sheet. But that that import, you say, yeah, but this all these styles in here, put them in that base layer. And all of a sudden, even though it loaded last in the page, it gets put at the beginning of the stack and it becomes weak. And it and wow. it so anyway, it has this power of you don't have to be so meticulous about your order. Yeah. You can load things asynchronously, put them into the layer that you want, and the browser figures it all out in a beautiful fashion. And I, I think under the hood, this is how Tailwind's doing. I was going to say, well, I don't right? know if that would help you because Tailwind uses that right. for their system of like getting the base, the utilities, and then the component layer. Yep. Yeah, and I yep. and you specify like everything like within a layer that you want to affect. So. Yeah, SAS has had it for a while. Post CSS has had it. So now it's it built in the language and you can use it um, today. That one has support everywhere. Yeah. Nice. You'll see, you'll see you'll see in a lot of my demos, oh, I make a, a layer called demo. So you're like, and then the other layer is called demo support. So it's like if you're reading the styles, they're self-commenting because it's like, here's what I want you to look at. Yeah. This is the demo. The rest is just crap supporting that. So it's like, forget about it. Um, and it's clear inside the layer. And if you go in the styles and you inspect, it says, here's the demo stuff. And here's the demo support stuff. So even in the styles pane, you can identify what I was trying to teach you and what is fluff. That's yeah. a really good way of looking at it. That I is. That's really awesome. Uh, what I was saying when I got kicked off, too, is you were saying, like, it beats out all the other ones. And I was reminded of the specificity game. You did it on the CSS podcast, like, where you, like, played the game with, like, each selector and, like, how many points they got. It was, yeah. it was awesome. So give that episode a listen. That is a good one. Yeah, we battle each other to try to see if we can figure out the score. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We have memorized less uh, logical properties. That's what this one is. Oh, uh, yeah. We kind of been talking about these already. Yep. Yep. And it's it's like it's OK. So here there's a couple of fun examples that I like to give in a real world context. Um, I, I have my dog is here. Nexus is here. Hi, Nexus. He looks up at me. He's like, I'm sleeping, man. Um, well, I'll take a Nexus for a walk. And someone goes, how old is she? And I'm like, it's a he. And <laughs> if that person had said, how old are they? They could have avoided the entire topic and awkwardness. <laughs> but they didn't. They said she. For some reason, they assumed that. Another good example is um, I reach out to shake your hand. And I say, uh, shake with your right hand. And they go, I don't have a right hand. I'm, I'm I'm an amputee and you're like, damn it. I should have just said, shake with your good hand or, Hey, let's shake hands. But yeah. somehow for some reason I was specific about, um, a hand, like a right or left hand, which is the same thing we're going to see with margin left and margin right, or specifying a gender for no reason. When I could have just said your dog, you know, like yeah. for some, I don't know why we project these things on people all the time. So the same thing happens in your CSS. Now you can say margin top 
if you only want to work with um, well, margin top is in a, as good examples like margin left or margin right. These are physical sides that are how you see them in your language. But a lot of times what we want is we want the padding at the end of the, the sentence. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you'd say inline end. So by adjusting yourself to these logical properties, margin inline, margin block, padding inline, padding block, inset instead of left, top, right, or bottom. Um, and there's like a, a few others, like border radius has these too. By adjusting to these, you don't have to care what language someone's in ever again. I'm serious. Like you don't have to change your site. Go to my site and flip it to right to left. I didn't do anything special for that. All I did was write logical properties. Go to my site and flip it into Japanese top right, uh, right, left. I didn't do anything to fix that. That's just logical properties. I wrote it in a new way that's agnostic to the physical box that I see and wrote it in a way that is representative for any box layout. And that's logical properties. So that's, a, that's why the pitches remember less instead of thinking I have to make ah. a right to left site, just write your site with logical properties. You don't care. I'm serious. Like you will literally the amount of anxiety and worries you have are gone. All you have to do is adjust your syntax ever so slightly. Love it. I was trying to figure out the memorize less and now I get it. Good clarification. Even though I read the paragraph like three times. Are there logical <laughs> properties for um, like position left, top, right, bottom? Yeah. So you have the inset property is um, allows you to specify all four sides at once, but that's not yes. actually uh, logical. You have to say inset in line, which will be the both sides of something or inset block, uh -huh. which is like top and bottom. Yep. Um, and just but like what about if you only yeah. wanted the top side? <laughs> like, yeah. what would inset that Inset block start. Yeah. Okay. Inset block start. Got it. And inset yeah, that's, block that's end. Our, yeah. I, that's I knew our that they like, existed. I just couldn't know. like get there to what they were. <laughs> yeah. It's a little tricky at first, uh, kind of like adjusting your language to not mention someone's pronouns all the time and to move to they. It's a slight that was adjustment. A great analogy. But, that was a good Thank you. Um, I noticed it with my. Anyway, I noticed it with people. I was like, they should have just, oh, this is just like logical properties. I used to give an example like ski. Uh, skiers have this thing called skiers left and skiers right. Um, and it's because you need to talk about the mountain, whether you're looking at the mountain or going down the mountain, you need to be able to say, which way are we going to go? And if you say skiers right, the person that orients themselves looking down the mountain and thinks to the right. That way, uh, right and left don't get mixed up somewhere in the conversation. You, um, It's a logical jargon created to c remove confusion that is what logical properties are yeah. uh i have a terrible example of this my wife's like we're i'm sitting stage right to watch my son in the play or whatever i'm like is that stage right like i'm looking at the stage or stage right but i don't know stage, which... like i don't get it i love the skiers example that's if like, you're on the stage right i think so. yeah yeah <laughs> but it's the same thing but it's still confusing to me like actors yeah. right <laughs> I get that. Like, that makes sense. Anyways. Boats have um, the same thing. Boats have four sides to them. Oh, How do yeah. you talk about the boat? If you're looking from the boat front to the back, right and left are different than right. if you're in the back of the boat looking front. That's Part why we have starboard, starboard or port. Yeah. yeah. You know what I, I learned the other day? I'm not a sailor. We don't live by, well, we do live by a lot of water, but <laughs> we don't go out on a boat. Um, I didn't realize that the buoy colors um so the, the phrase is red, right, returning. So in order to remember the lights, I'm always like, what the heck's right, though? Like, I don't understand what returning. They finally explain it to me. It's the larger body of water you'll always be returning from. I was like, oh. So if you come in from the ocean, the red should be on your right, returning from the ocean. I was like, oh. It took me years to realize that. So the things you learn. We can edit all that out, too. So. <laughs> Uh, we're going to actually jump into our perfect picks because Adam's awesome site we can talk about for like a half hour and it's his perfect pick. So here we go. Oh, yes. Gradient.style. I feel like I, I want to give you control somehow. You should probably share your screen because like I will fidget with this thing as you instruct me, but we'll see how this goes. Sure. Um, okay, so yeah, you're already looking at adjusting color stops. So if you drag right or up, it increases the number. If you drag left or down, it decreases the number. And so um, I'm doing my best here to follow the specs 
So you get all the full power of gradients. Um, that's why uh, here there's like a little slider between the two color stops on the right. Uh, change that one. This one? Yeah, that one. Change that one. This is a little known feature oh. in CSS called a transition hint. It's special to CSS. It's not present in design tools. And it is a very cool feature of CSS gradients. In fact, um, hit the black and white striped preset in the bottom left there. I think it uses that uh, color stop. Uh, that one uses double position. You said design tool. So Figma doesn't have this? Figma doesn't. I think Photoshop way back in the day had the concept of a transition hint, but actually, no, it was double position is what they had. So double position here, go here and go to the yellow one uh, and drag just the yellow slider, like the top of the two on the right hand side. Oh, sorry. This. Yeah, cool. Drag that one to the left. See how it split? Yep. It's oh. called double position syntax. Oh. That's existed in, in CSS forever. And people just don't know that it really exists. And so now I'm visualizing it, and you can see why and what it does. And it's a very cool um, feature, again, of CSS, where you can sort of say it's not just a position in the line. It spans a part of the line. Like, you'll get a chunk of yellow. Instead of a moment of yellow into pink, you can chunk it. Um, yeah, I think of it as like a percentage. Like, you get a percent of your full gradient to be like that color. I use this all the time in Figma, but I do it by like putting the dots on top of each other. So I kind of trick it a little bit. <laughs> so nice. I will like add more nodes and, and then pull them closer together. And it will make the gradient like as small so it's not even noticeable. Cool. Um, cool. Another thing in the very top right, you see color space. This is one of the parts of this being an HD gradient. So uh, change that to HSL, for example, or even sRGB or something like that. See how different your, uh, your oh yeah, here, change that to longer. I haven't or heard longer. of OKLCH. What is I haven't either. I was like, what is this? I don't understand what's going on. Yes, this is part of why I built this tool is we have new color spaces out. Uh, mm -hmm. They're in Firefox. They're pretty much in every browser now. And these new color spaces, do um, different things with color. So just like HSL has been a friendly way for us to be like, oh, I want a lighter pink. OKLCH is very similar in that it has a hue, just like uh, HSL did, and then it has a lightness channel. So if you wanna make it lighter, you can adjust the L. Actually here, you can um, click the little red swatch there and you'll pull up a color picker. It's a next gen color picker. Uh, sorry. Uh, you can either click the pink dot that's overlaid or you can click the pink dot that's on the right hand panel. Ah, okay, so I have made the world's first next-gen CSS color picker here. Um, you can choose in the drop-down on the top left that shows you all the new color spaces you have to choose from. We can't see it, but I'm sure everyone oh, at home will oh, be able to go yeah. experiment themselves. All right. um, so we have lightness, color, hue. It's no. chroma, yeah. Cro it's like saturation, but it's Saturate. not. Saturate, okay, yeah. Yep, and, and so that's alpha. the... And alpha. And so, yeah, also you'll notice that there's no RGBA or HSLA anywhere in here. Those are dead, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Same with commas. RGBA, RGBA, is, RGBA is dead? I just learned RGBA about it. RGBA is dead. It's completely irrelevant and dead and deprecated in favor of the slash syntax, which normalizes all oh, of them. Okay. In fact, uh, pull the alpha there in that color picker. Just like pull the alpha down and you'll see the color, um, the syntax mm -hmm. update. No. What am I looking for? Sorry. Oh, up uh, here. The alpha, the A uh, at the bottom of the color picker. Oh, uh, no, you had it right. Yeah, pull up the right. color picker. Okay. Color picker. And the A is the. There's an A on the. Oh, there it is. Like, yeah, the yeah. alpha. Okay, so now you're changing alpha. And then just above those sliders, you can see the syntax changing where it says RGB. Uh, well, here, change your alpha not to 100, and then you'll see the yeah. new syntax. It'll add the slash. There you go. Okay, that's what I'm using now. So hopefully. Yeah, that that's the bottom okay. syntax. Yep, so no commas, just spaces, and the slash for alpha. And you'll notice that all the new color spaces use the same syntax. Three channels, slash, and alpha. This is so really embarrassing, cool. but uh, we're, doing some, we're doing some dynamic stuff. So all of the, like from Skeleton, which we're using in Black Hat, all of the um, CSS variables are set with RGB. And then, like, I kept running into this slash. I'm like... The division on this is not making sense because there's like always always this number and I'm like putting it in. I'm like, I don't I don't get it. And like finally it dawned on me, like that is the freaking alpha piece to all of this. And it made life so much simpler. Nice. Yeah. We used to have to jump between two functions. It was annoying. You're like, okay, I need alpha. You're like, oh man, now I have to call a totally exactly. different function. Yeah. And so they've normalized it. So, so that color picker. 
helps you pick all these colors. These colors also go into wide gamuts. So if you're on a Mac, and I'm sure you're on a nice Mac that's since 2017, you have wide gamut colors. And wide gamut colors are more vibrant, they're better, their gradients have less steps in them, there's more data that they can pack into the gradient, and so the results are better overall. So what this tool is trying to help you do is um, pick colors in these new color spaces just for funsies, and then make your gradient render in these new color spaces, which give you much better results. And so um, it's helping you not only learn what CSS is capable of with gradients, but it's also helping you level up into this new HDR uh, color and HDR uh, interpolation. This is wild. So uh, what's the like, OK Lab versus HSL? Was, like, where should people yeah. be going with all of this? I'll give you two quick tips. This would be if you want to walk away and just be like, I need to know the best of the new color stuff now. Um, OK Lab for gradients and animation. OKLCH for design systems and just every other color that you need. Can you give me reasoning behind it or we'll just leave Absolutely. it? Absolutely. OK. Yeah. Um, OK Lab is a color space. So it's kind of funny. I actually 3D printed one. Wait, wait, wait. I'll put you on the big screen. Hey. I don't know. Here. Yeah, there you go. OK, so this is a color space. Just like the RGB cube had all the colors packed into a cube, this is the OK Lab space. And notice how funky it is. Yeah, it almost this... looks like a square sometimes, right? It's funky because uh, the way that humans see color is not conveniently a square. You know, that shouldn't be too surprising that like yeah. a cylinder of color, right. that's not how our eyes work. Right. A square of color, that's not how our eyes work. This is the how our eyes work. So if I'm, if I'm looking at that yeah. because of the curvature of my eye and how it like interprets, that's it. Kind of. It's more like your eyes are very good at seeing blue and green and they suck at seeing yellow gotcha. and stuff like that. And so okay. what you have is um, there's two different things to talk about here. You have a gamut, which is how many colors you have to choose from. Uh, and so in, up until you saw this tool, you've always been using hex, HSL and RGB, which is always the gamut of sRGB, standard RGB. It's a 25 year old color space that um, has been great for us on all this time. We are now getting, I know you've got a TV that's probably UHD or OLED or something like that. I know you bought your laptop and it said, it has 1,000 nits. And you're like, I don't know what nits are. It's telling me this is the best <laughs> color that I've ever, and I'm like, must be good. So these new color spaces use that part of what you bought. If you use hex, it does not use that part of what you bought. Like literally it is capped. sRGB is capped to an amount of color that can fit inside of a tennis sure. ball. Let's just say if you use OKLCH, you can access colors the size of a basketball. Wow. Yeah. You're going to access the color that your new display goes, oh, yeah, watch this green. And that green is more bumping. Um, and so that's that my tool will have uh, way more vibrant gradients and colors than will any other tool because it is using the new capabilities of your display. So there's like there's the gamut, which is how many colors it can have. And then there's the way that you ask for colors from it. So we've got the tennis ball, hex, HSL, RGB, three different ways to ask for colors from the tiny little tennis ball. And OK, then LCH. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if, if you're on like an older, older computer, older monitor, whatever, it's even though you're specifying like all these basketball worth, it can still show the tennis ball correctly. That's what I'm. That's what I was wondering. So, if you're in a design system that was built off hex codes and you change it to this, how does that color shift? Like, if you want that brand color to be your brand color, and it was a yeah. hex code, and you change okay. it to OKLCH, how how does it shift and not be a yeah. different color? Yeah. Yeah. There's two different two different good questions here. I'll start with Brittany's. Um, if you're in hex and you want to move to OKLCH, you can convert, like in my tool, you can go paste a hex color in there, open up the color picker, switch to OKLCH, it will convert it for you. Um, like, yeah, you can just type in the little area there or um, or switch to RGB. Anyway, um, OKLCH, since it's a bigger basketball, it also can do everything the tennis ball can do. So if what you did was ask for a color that's from the tennis ball size in the new one, it'll just give you one that's in that smaller space. Okay. You're, you're using a new syntax to ac access a color, um, right? Yeah, and then you can pop that open uh, by clicking the little swatch there in the dropdown. Choose OKLCH, and you should see almost no change. 
That's oh, because okay. your color, what well, now, but hold on, pump that back open. Yep. And then grab the C, the chroma there, and pull the chroma up to the right. Now yeah. you're in an HDR color. And you could even like drop your lightness if you liked your darker purple. How does but that? You just ask, yeah, like, go ahead. But I, th I think like what Brittany's asking, like I, I know our coding cat colors, 5E12A6. That's why I typed it in. Yeah. That to me does not look the same as 5E12A6. So, well, it, it did until not, we pumped the chroma. Right. That's, that's my question. Okay. So, the chroma, we ask for more saturation. So, you, and you can adjust your lightness there and go down if you want it. But basically, there's, there are more purples to choose from. And there's even more vibrant purples, even in the darker ranges, actually, especially in the darker ranges. Um, so, more so, colors okay, so, yeah. that we had access to. And this yeah. may be like if you're working with a brand, you might have your designers go and have them switch to this and look at colors that might be appropriate for like a rebrand, but you may not want to change like the actual brand color and then play with that. Yeah. So right? we, we bumped okay. the chroma just for funsies, but you could convert into OKLCH and OKLCH can show every color that yeah. X can that without sense. loss or without transforming it. It's just a bigger space that you're asking for a color that's not at the edge. It's all yeah, good. Gotcha. I have to tell you, um, I would like this color once we bumped it up better. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then to Alex's first question, which is like, what happens if the, the user is on an old display? Mm -hmm. It's not HDR, you know, Super X, Ultra HD, whatever. Um, then that browser and that operating system, they all work together and say, hey, we can only show tennis balls. Uh, a color was asked for in the basketball size. And the browser and the display go, cool, whoop de doo Put it down here. So they it, it's get like the closest color? Yep. And it's have... built into the display to basically just say, throw away all the extra coolness that was supposed to be there and give them the purple that we can do. It's our maximum purple. I have to tell you, I, I work on a very nice monitor that's like 32 inch, but I have this like for Discord and social media and stuff. I, I set a monitor that's tiny over here. For whatever reason i'm cheap i guess uh when i put it over there though it is significantly different and it kind of blows my thing. mind it's like significantly that. different try on those gradients in the bottom left they're especially good actually display your screen again too because there's an oh. hd button in the top left of the little thing there click that for us oh, uh HD. top left of the canvas oh gotcha this yep and there you go. Did you see how it changed? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So what that's I, actually what it looks like on my other screen. That's yeah. crazy. And that's because yeah. I clamp the colors for you to see, even on your super screen, I clamp them into the tennis ball and I say, here's tennis ball versus basketball. That's li like literally what that's doing for you. Also, if you click the that's get the so code cool. button, it's in the top right of that square window you're in there. Uh, um, yeah, right there. I give you the new syntax and the old syntax. So the classic mm. gradient there on the bottom is what you saw when the HDR button was off. And the gradient syntax at the top there says in OK Lab, right? So we're interpolating in a new color space. Oh, we didn't finish that. OK, so we have like these color space shapes. Oh, yeah. The hey. reason OK Lab is better for a gradient is because the shape of it is made for when a color and a color need to travel, which is what a gradient does. It travels yeah. between them. It's optimized to maintain vibrancy. The shape wow. of it is literally packed into a shape to travel nicely between colors. OKLCH, though, on the other hand, is a uh, color space that's much better at its ability to like lighten and darken. It also has a more humanistic way to talk about it because you still have lightness, you still have a hue, and you still have chroma, where a lab has lightness A and B, and A and B are not intuitive. So it's good for gradients to interpolate in, but you can still ask for colors with OKLCH. Mm. And that's what my tool does. So you pick colors in a familiar way, you know, change the chroma, change the hue, whoop de doo um, But then the output, the, the transition between them is done in a color space that will maintain vibrancy through the middle. That's one of the clutch things is the middle of a cube is the light colors. And so if you go from the two corners, you're going to pass through. It's called the dead zone. And you're going to get a gradient that goes a little gray, a little desaturated in the middle where OK Lab will not do that. That's really wild. I wonder if we have the capability like in Tailwind currently because you have like from two and then is well, it through. Tailwind really is just CSS. Like, I know. And that's why I'm like sitting here mentally going, how do I? specify okay lch for that exchange so anyways that's my own nonsense that maybe we'll figure out you just 
figure the syntax out and put it in there. I want to keep talking yeah. to you for a long time about the stack that you used to build that in the whole site. And I'm really excited about that, but I do have to pick my kids up some, soon. So yeah, no worries. I, I really like spell kit is like my favorite thing. And the fact that you built that with spell kit is just shows its power. I love it. It's a really cool tool. You should have looked at the radial uh, tool too, because it shows you how radial oh, gradients actually when work. When I get home, I and will it's, play. It's good stuff. <laughs> Britt, you want to do your picks real quick? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I've got way too many, probably. <laughs> so, Here's your first one. So Spelt Lab, we were just talking about Spelt, but Spelt Lab was uh, for the hackathon, and maybe I'm ruining a little bit of the surprise, but I don't know when this goes out, and maybe it, it was be. tweeted about. So. Yeah, it was, and uh, the hackathon announcements are coming out next Saturday, the sixth. Maybe I should have picked Spelt Summit because I'm co-hosting <laughs> Spelt Summit too. Um, but Spelt Lab is web containers and you have the full node ecosystem right here, but this allows you to, like the REPL has just Spelt at spelt.dev slash tutorial, you can do the REPL, but um, this has the full power of Spelt Kit, the full node ecosystem right in the browser, which is insane. Yeah, and actually releasing right after we're recording this uh, web containers with Eric Simmons um, from Stackblitz. Uh, the they're working on the web container stuff. Check that episode out. We dive into it pretty, pretty decent. I think that is the one we're still waiting on Safari for web container support. Yes, it is. Finally, okay, yeah. So probably. if you open that in Safari, I don't think it will work. Okay. Or maybe it's Firefox, I think, actually. Stackblitz maybe? doesn't work in Firefox. Okay. I know. Anyway, yeah, one of them that doesn't work in one of those two. <laughs> it's it's looking rough in Safari. I know that. So, who knows? Uh, your second, third, fourth. I don't even know what. We're I, I don't know. Like, we were talking a lot before, <laughs> and I was just going through all the things. So we were talking about Elk Dot Zone, um, because we were having this whole blue sky Mastodon Twitter conversation <laughs> rant that I wish everyone could have heard. But um, I know I really great, need a quick but, record right when we start from now. I know. Yeah. If you are on Mastodon, this is a great client that makes it look a little more Twitter-like for Mastodon. And I really like the styles, um, except for maybe the orange. So do what Adam did and like style it with your own colors. I feel like I know Art all boosts these people. For the win. This is crazy. Your third pick, you which release we- should a plug-in for that. <laughs> and we, yeah, we, my third we pick- We this perfectly, folks. Just, yes, right on uh, me and Amy Dutton at jams.conf last November. And we got to hear an amazing talk by Miriam Suzanne on container queries, something we were talking about today. So if you're interested in learning more about container queries, it was a really good talk. And I think it's pretty short. Yeah, like 19, 20 minutes. Yeah, that's a good one. What up, self-teach me? Um, my pick is SST. And so... Always kind of looking at new stuff, way to ship things. Um, and this is another one of those where you can ship out to AWS. Um, somewhat similar to how Vercel does it um, with the ease of use, but um, totally different too. And I'll just leave it at that because I haven't had enough time to play with the whole thing yet. So check that out. Another way to, to ship things very easily and quickly um, onto AWS. So it's like built on top of AWS so you get like some better developer experience. Yeah, exactly. Like we all know how AWS shipping things is it's notorious for yeah, not great right. developer experience. Yeah, yeah Plumi helps out uh, if you're using AWS Amplify. There's some niceness there, but the actual like it's still it's still kind of rough. So we we actually have um, forgetting the name Flight Control Brandon Myers Brandon Mayer whatever. We're having Flight Control on uh, soon too. So check that episode out. We'll ship some cool. some really cool things as well. Anyways, Adam, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. You blow my mind every time we every talk. I time. don't understand front end the way I should understand it. Uh, it's it's absolutely incredible. That's thank what you. he's here for. He's the expert to teach us, right? I feel like I'm like doing better all the time. And then I talk to Adam, <laughs> like, this isn't good. It's always <laughs> no, a fun doing great. experience to have you on. So make sure you check out all of Adam's sites, nerdy.dev, at nerdy.dev, find all the things now. I, I don't even know what to Have say you anymore. To so. at, from at Argyle Inc. on Twitter? On Twitter, I'm still Argyle Inc. Um, but yeah, Blue Sky, I'm nerdy.dev. Uh, nerdy.dev is where I'm I'm pretty much building my own social network there, right? I, I post from multiple personas on my website, so enjoy that. 
Yes. <laughs> I like that. That's fun. Um, well, anyways, thank you so much. And I hope everyone learned a little more CSS today. Take care, y'all. Yeah.